Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Christy Beck, who is Vice President of Product Management at Alemica. And today we're going to talk about making better lo logistics sourcing decisions uh, with data-driven optimization. Uh, you know, this is a topic that, you know, as a lot of more and more companies are beginning to, uh, you know, be more global, uh, you know, uh, become multimodal, uh, you know, source from a lot of different countries, so on and so forth. You know, the transportation operations are just becoming much more complex. Uh, and that's having an impact on how they go about, you know, sourcing their logistics, uh, you know, requirements. Um, and the question is, are the processes and the technologies that companies have used historically, are they still adequate in today's more global, more dynamic business environment? So that's, that's kind of at the heart of the question I want to explore today with uh, with Christy. So very happy to have her uh, here on the program. Um, I just uh, want to remind those of you that are joining us live today that part of our goal here at Talking Logistics is to make this conversational. So if you've got a, a question for uh, Christy as we're having a conversation here, uh, you can do so via the submit a question button, and I'll keep an eye on it. And if it's a good and appropriate question, I'll uh, certainly you know weave it into our uh, conversation. Uh, so with that, Christy, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, Christy, you're, you're a first-time guest here, and, and like I always do when uh, someone joins the program for the first time, I'm, I'm always curious uh, to, to, to learn how you know folks get in, involved in the supply chain logistics industry to begin with. So, um, why don't you briefly tell us a little bit about your career path, you know, how and why you got involved uh, in this industry, and kind of what your current role and responsibilities are there at Alemica. Mm -hmm. um, I would say... Probably my first foray into supply chain was about 20 years ago. I came home from college for a summer and worked for my father's construction business. And I went to work for as a buyer, essentially. And through that time, I really noticed um, I liked negotiations. I liked the mental chess game. Um, I really enjoyed the you know orchestrating and planning that it took to get all the materials and services in the same place. Um, and, you know, I went back that fall and I changed my major from teaching to supply chain and operations, which at the time that was the mid 90s. And so in the mid 90s, there weren't a lot of schools that had supply chain. So I was lucky in that respect. Um, I had no idea that I would be getting into, you know, essentially a, a career field that would revolutionize, you know, over the next 10 years and certainly revolutionize the way business, you know, businesses operate. So it was a good um, experience for me. And then early in my career, I went um, to work for a commercial airline, so sort of right, right out of college, and in the supply chain area. And for me, that was the first time really that you know I spent a lot of time doing network analytics. You, you learn very quickly um, how to deal with a very complex global supply chain in that in that business. And so um, after September 11th, you know, the, obviously the airlines were in turmoil. And so I was presented with an opportunity to go to work as a consultant for a technology, essentially a supply chain technology company for the aviation space. So um, I thought that would be a bright idea. You know, the industry is already in turmoil. How much worse could it be to go to work for a startup, essentially? And so I think at the time, my family and friends thought I was crazy. Um, I know they did. They, you know, they were like, what are you doing? But, um, you know, that was the early 2000s, and it was a really exciting time for anybody who was in technology at that point, particularly supply chain technology, because, you know, that was really when things were starting to ramp up. And so I spent the next eight years essentially flying around the world working with the biggest commercial airlines um, and had a lot of time with um, UPS and FedEx was one of my clients for years. And so you know, working with those clients, you really get to understand logistics as a business and all the complexities that really go around um, the global supply chain. So, you know, I've lived in, I guess I've lived in two different countries uh, overseas and, you know, done business in 35 other countries. So it's been a really great experience for me um, to see that. And four years ago, I came to Alemica to bring some of that sort of experience in supply chain view um, to the process industries essentially that Alemica works for. Um, so I essentially have responsibility for our sourcing management solutions and those are really in the contract, the source to contract process and so that would include solutions like spend up, you know, analytics, um, uh, master data management, e-sourcing type of solution, sourcing optimization, 
and um, contract management. So any of the solutions that are sort of in those functional areas are my responsibility. Well, that's a great uh, th th that's a great uh, you know career path and and just to think back in terms of how it got started in terms of. Uh, you know, uh, being with your dad there and kind of a little light bulb going off and, and changing your major and, and certainly the, uh, uh, the path that that led you toward uh, over the past few years. And certainly, you know, I think with the, uh, I don't think I've had anyone on the program before that had, uh, you know, I, it sounds like as in-depth experience with the airlines uh, as you have. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a new, that's a new one for us here on, on Talking Logistics. So great. Um, uh, great background, great context, which then kind of leads me to getting to the topic now. My, you know, my first question, you know, obviously you've been around, um, you know, the industry for a while now in, in various different roles. Um, you know, when you look across kind of all these years, I mean, what's different about logistics sourcing, you know, process today compared to, let's say, you know, five or ten years ago? Yeah. I think probably the biggest difference is to look at 10 years ago. So I think five years ago, um, the types of things and the way that we've sourced logistics, the leaders were doing five years ago, now it's more broadly today. But if we look back 10 years, I think that's where you'll see a significant change in the way that we're sourcing and the types of technologies that we're using. So, uh, you know, 10 years ago, there were companies, and certainly a lot of the companies that we worked with, um, were using network optimization in their logistics bids in terms of making decisions, but um, they were writing their own code. So they had data scientists, and essentially they're making their own code. So from a sourcing perspective, um, you know, that was really essentially aimed at companies that were very, very large, complex, had the resources and the time and the energy to be able to devote to, you know, essentially building those programs in-house. And so what we see today is, you know, there's, you know, software providers in the market that can provide the same sort of, um, you know, algorithms and, you know, rigorous analytics, um, but they do it in a way that is more user-friendly for, you know, the average logistics person and the average buyer, let's say. And I think that, um, you know, when we look back at, at the solutions that were made, and certainly we had a couple of older solutions um, that we built in the mid-2000s mid that, you know, are, are completely obsolete. And, you know, we were in the process of launching those new solutions to replace that because the technology and the foundations of the technology that were really um, available back then are, are completely different than, than it is in the market today. So, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of companies can be looking again, I think, at the practices and the business practices that they have um, to see whether or not, um, you know, essentially there are new tools that they can use to, to help what they're doing today as far as sourcing is concerned. Yeah, you know, you, you know, that's a good point. I think, uh, you, you know, you're right. I think I saw the same thing. I mean, I've been kind of involved in this industry now, you know, for almost 18 years now. And you know, a lot of times when you looked at, you know, these types of, t you know, tools, um, they were really geared towards those large companies that are very complex and difficult to use. In many cases, um, you really had to, in addition to bringing in the technology, um, you needed the resources of people that actually knew how to, you know, I would say almost people with the PhDs that really understood how that software and those tools work to, to help companies actually, you know, deploy them, right? So it really was less... Um, it wasn't just a technology piece of it. It was, uh, you know, it, it came along with some consulting as well because a lot of companies just didn't have the internal resources, you know, to do that. Um, you know, and you already touched a little bit upon this, but maybe you can kind of expand on it a little bit. I mean, so, so it sounds like it's fair to say that kind of the traditional approach to logistics outsourcing and kind of the tools that, that were, you know, companies have used are kind of no longer adequate in, in today's, you know, more dynamic, more global, uh, uh, you know, business environment, you know, um, is, is that true? And, and if so, you know, what, what are some of the shortcomings? Yeah, I think that the a lot of the solutions that are out there today are, um, it, it depends on the maturity of the client too, I would say, uh, in terms of, of if they're just bidding single mode logistics, um, you know, that's obviously much more simple than we see a lot of our clients starting to look into more multimodal logistics and even if they're not going to market at the same time on truck ocean and rail or air um, they're at least looking at optimizing all those things together through their network so that they're always making the optimal choices um, based on the, the network that they have at the time so they're not looking at 
um, you know, just their, you know, uh, trucking rates or just their ocean at, at the same time. They're really looking at all of those things as an interconnected network. And so I think that some of the solutions that do exist today, um, there's a couple of, I guess, maybe three areas that I think about. One is sort of basic e-sourcing solutions. And we do see some customers when we, you know, talk to prospective customers, they're using sort of standard e-sourcing solutions to gather bids from the, you know, suppliers, and they're still working on those bids manually. And so, you know, really your mainstream ERP and, um, and basic e-sourcing solutions are not built for, you know, they, they might be at best built for light analytics, but they're really not built for optimization. So then, in that case, you're being forced into um, doing something in Excel or maybe it's Access or another homegrown program that you guys, you know, that our customers have done in the past. Um, and then we look at the next level up of sourcing optimization solutions that do exist. And to be fair, a lot of the sourcing optimizations that do exist were built for logistics. I mean, a lot of them were built purposely for logistics and have been over time expanded and um, you know, it's a little like Frankenstein. You start with one thing, you know, in the technology industry and it, it morphs over time into something else. And so, um, you know, we do see our clients using, let's say mid nine or mid eight or mid 2000s technology for sourcing logistics. And in a lot of cases, those, um, those solutions require a lot of custom programming to your point, or they require a lot of services to use. Um, you know, you're still, you still need access perhaps to data scientists or consultants that actually know how to use a solution. And so for us, I think that's a big drawback. Um, you know, in a lot of cases you want your, you want the solution to fit what you need to do from a bid perspective. You don't want to fit your bid into a solution. So I think that's important. Um, or if it doesn't fit, then you're, you know, essentially spending a lot of money um, trying to customize that solution. And I think the third area really is looking at um, how the, you know, probably the shortcomings of, of a lot of the solutions that exist out there are looking at how they're modeling and optimizing the constraints. So um, even the solutions that exist out there, you know, a lot of them are um, are limited, I would say, in the, the amount of uh, fields that you can optimize on. You know, so obviously cost is a major factor, but um, they're really limited in the amount of fields that they can gather, let's say, and optimize on. Um, and so, for example, as an example with, you know, some of the chemical companies that we have, you know, if you have... If you're bidding your uh, truckloads, let's say, you know, trucking bids, and you have hazmat materials that are going to go on those trucks, then you have a different level of service that you probably require for those, you know, hazmat materials versus non-hazmat materials. And in that case, um, you want to be able to constrain, let's say, on a particular business unit or a particular lane or client that you're going to, or even, you know, commodity or material that you're selling. And a lot of the solutions that are, you know, exist in the market today can't get to that level. And that's where, particularly in the industries we work in, it's really important um, to be able to, you know, specify and optimize and constrain um, what kind of business you're willing to award to which carriers based on, you know, very specific business requirements that are sometimes, you know, even down to the, the type of, of materials that you're shipping. You know, it, it, it seems like that, um you know, to your point there in terms of, you know, the, the, it sounds like some of the, 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 the evolution that's taken place is number one, you know, making these solutions more user friendly or more configurable, right? Uh, easier to use, more intuitive, if you will. Um, but on the flip side, because the environment is becoming more complex, because the trend is toward looking at, rather than looking at each mode separately or each lane separately to really take a more integrated and holistic view of your transportation network, uh, and kind of take, take a, uh, again, a more complex analysis, if you will, uh, around it. Um, you know, so th those, those two things kind of seem to go counter uh, each other. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, are there underlying, um, technological capabilities that are now enabling this? In particular, I'm thinking of, of particularly for the latter around cloud computing, because it, it, one of the things that I've, I've seen is that thanks to, cloud computing, you know, processing power today is so much, almost infinite compared to what it was, uh, you know, again, five, ten years ago, that now, you know, a lot of companies, you can indeed kind of take this more integrated, more complex view because the computing power is there 
to actually do it in a, in a reasonable time frame. Is, is that kind of an accurate statement? Yeah, I think it is. And as an example, um, you know, like I, I sort of mentioned before, one of our old solutions that we had built on very old technology, again, limited by the amount of servers and things that were there to support it, um, really, you know, we would have to queue events um, and optimization, you know, to run scenarios or what if scenarios. And I know a lot of other solutions out there in the marketplace do that. Um, you know, our new solution based on the new technology, essentially, and a lot of companies are moving this direction, is cloud-based and it is, you know, we're able to essentially ramp up servers as we need to to handle the optimization that's happening. And so, um, you know, we don't run into it often, to be honest, because the, you know, the solution is actually built to handle that. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, when you're starting to look at these very broad multimodal networks, I mean, it's really important to be able to have that bandwidth. So I think that that's a good point. So, so, so let's talk now. Uh, you know, just just to get kind of the terminology straight, because sometimes you know we, we like to use these, these these buzzwords and terms, and 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 you know we have it in our title here of, of this episode, but um, and that is you know data driven optimization. I mean, what does that exactly mean, data driven optimization? So I would say that the simplest explanation of data driven optimization is really that data optimization that allows. Um, a particular user or you know the decision maker to make the decisions that they have with all of the available data that they have so not just you know for logistics very simply you expect people to make decisions on um, you know on pricing and perhaps you know some high level of carrier performance um, and you know perhaps currency but I'm talking about other pieces of data that maybe aren't even in the bid process so um, carrier compliance can we start to look at how often our carriers are actually giving us the rates that we've, you know, we've secured with them. Um, making that a factor of the bid. Can I take uh, carrier performance and their safety ratings, for example? And again, this is where it's very critical in some of the businesses that we're in with hazardous materials and non-hazardous hazardous materials to be able to, you know, really factor in safety ratings, um, not just on, you know, my particular loads, but let's say on, you know, on that carrier overall. overall. Um, and more external factors like that we see um, not just in logistics, but we see also in raw materials that companies are really starting to look at what are the other factors that are included external to the bid process, the market factors that I want to take into account. And really, that's, that's what we mean when we're talking about data-driven optimization. So not just the data that's related to the bid, but external data that is important or information that is important um, that provides context to making those decisions. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. I mean, sometimes I, I think to kind of just echo what you said. Uh, I think historically, a lot of companies are focused on you know uh, a, a few key you know data elements or, or or quantitative factors that they use to help you know sort or optimize around, if you will, and and those are all still important whether it's you know the actual rate itself or the, the available capacity, so on and so forth. But, but I think there's also a lot of qualitative uh, information that uh, uh, also comes into play. And how do you kind of model that or capture that within the solution to, to incorporate that as part of the, the, the decision-making process, I think is, you know, is very important. Um, you know, we all know that the quality of the optimization, of an optimization solution is, is dependent on the, you know, quality of the, the data going in, right? I mean, it's the classic, you know, garbage in, you know, garbage out. So, I mean, what data is required? I mean, where does it come from? And, and how do you ensure that, you know, uh, that it's timely and accurate? Mm -hmm. So, a lot of the customers we work with, we all have the same problem. And as a supply chain operating network, I mean, one of our major tenants is to figure out, is to help solve the data problem. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about data and how do we get it right and how do we make sure that it's accurate. Um, so I would say generally, what we're, you know, most of what we're pulling for logistics um, sourcing, obviously, is shipment data. We're looking at, you know, not only the the pricing, but the delivery, uh, you know, the customer's delivery. Am I getting the um, the information I need? And essentially, for all the fields, I mean, one of the the challenges I think that a lot of companies have is that you might get some of the data, but you're not going to get all of the data. So some of the things that we're looking at doing is, can we 
get that data from ancillary uh, data sources. So maybe not the carrier specifically, but we can we pick up that information from a port per se or from you know the broker or other information sources. So that we're looking at you know more of a is there a way to triangulate and validate that that data that's coming through um, for us. And I think the other big challenge is um, data that just doesn't exist. So um, sometimes it's not even that it's bad data, you need to scrub it. You know, there are obviously a lot of tools around that are available in the marketplace to scrub and normalize the data that is available. But I think the bigger problem is what happens when the data is not even there. And so um, I'm not going to sit here and say, hey, we can make data out of nothing because um, nobody can do that. But I think that's sort of you know, understanding and providing a closed loop from the sourcing process to the execution process is really important. So that the, you know, the sourcing folks that are pulling the data and starting to work with that data are talking through the, you know, that process with the execution teams so that there's really an I very, I guess, clear visibility of what kind of data do we need to be capturing and to make sure that we're capturing it in the process. So I think that, um, you know, data quality is a process it's not you know a quick fix and I think that you know everyone essentially whether it's your service providers you know you know or your technology providers or even the business itself needs to be involved in that process to you know to make sure that the data quality is there no I great point and you know I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of you know supply chain operating networks and you know having this you know namely you know, having a, a network where you, you've got multiple trading partners really exchanging data and information and executing processes over a common platform. And one of the big value propositions that I always talk about with regards to supply chain operating networks is because you have all this data flowing through the, through the network from multiple different parties, you know, that gives the network provider uh, the opportunity to leverage that data to perhaps provide some benchmarking services, right? Uh, and provide kind of this external benchmark that companies can use for whether it's sourcing or other types of, uh, you know, uh, just continuous improvement opportunities. Um, do you see that as an opportunity here as well in terms of, of leveraging the network and the data in the network uh, as another input, if you will, or another data source uh, that can help in the sourcing process? Absolutely. And, uh I mean, for us, that's definitely part of the long-term strategy. And I know you've had Cindy Hain on before who works um, essentially my counterpart in logistics. And we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, how are we going, how do we get, gather the data that we need and how do we feed the data back and forth from, from the solutions. And so um, I think that from a supply chain operating network perspective, um, you know, we really do have an advantage in, a, in that way over a lot of other sourcing optimization solutions that are out there um, because we, we are able to pick up other data points essentially than, than what you might pick up in an ERP, for example, because we're, you know, we're on both sides of the transaction in a lot of cases or in some cases um, with the customer as well. So not just the shipment data, but a lot of the customer order delivery data and your your delivery performance to the customer and that type of data is very, very critical and I think often overlooked in, in the sourcing process is, you know, from your, looking from your customer's perspective, how are you doing and as a result of that, you know, how are your carriers doing on behalf of you? And so I think that's also another perspective that, um, you know, that leveraging essentially a supply chain operating network or your external, um, external, you know, uh, platforms essentially will give you that visibility. Great, great. So, so can you share with us, you know, some, some use cases or, or customer examples that kind of show how, you know, they're achieving better outcomes uh, by using data-driven optimization? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, a lot of our customers are starting to look at, and I mentioned this earlier, instead of going to market on one particular mode at a time, they're really looking at very multimodal, um, you know, bids, let's say. Uh, so they're going to tender in this time of year. We're getting into that tender season, you know, where they're going into the market in a variety of different uh, modes at the same time, and they're really looking to optimize across all those modes. And so I think the question is a lot of sourcing people, as they go through the process, they, you know, the question they're asking is, how do I, how do I, bid the same lanes that I bid last year, or how do I do those same lanes 
um, in a way that's cheaper or more efficient or better service. Um, but I think the question that that we're starting our customers to see and and really we're starting to ask ourselves is um, how should we be doing that? So let's take into account, you know, from a multimodal standpoint, I think we're seeing customers take into account a lot more variables than just the transportation rates. So duties and taxes and where is the flow of material coming from and to and what is, um, you know, not just um, what is the cost of that, but what is the risk associated with that? So, you know, what areas of the world are you going through that, you know, there potentially is high risk or low risk? Um, are you looking to go through specific ports where you may have, um, you know, congestion or, you know, other issues? So I would say definitely looking more holistically at not just, you know, the pricing piece, but, you know, as you mentioned, also the qualitative piece. Um, in a way that I think, you know, just hasn't, I think hasn't really happened in the last five to 10 years. I think, you know, people are starting to really think uh, more end to end in that respect. And, um, and not just for outbound freight, but, you know, inbound as well. We also you know, see, oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, I was going to say, we also see much a trend, and this is sort of adjacent to logistics, but a trend, um, you know, in your long lead time materials and things like that, where logistics is becoming um, so much more of involved in the material sourcing or distribution process. Um, than it has been, and predominantly on the inbound side as well. I think more customers of ours are really looking at how do they manage the inbound supply chain very, very well, um, and a big component of that is logistics. And so, you know, for their largest and most strategic raw materials, instead of going to market just for those materials and finding out what the prices are, they're starting to look at the network and the flow of those materials inbound to their production facilities. And you know, should I be using suppliers in different areas um, based on the logistics that it takes to get to my, my nearest production facility? Yeah, what, what I was going to say, and, and kind of kind of building off what you just said there is, I mean, it strikes me that um, probably something that companies are starting to do more or should be doing more in conjunction, either as a prerequisite or uh, in parallel is what, what I would consider, you know, network design, right? So it's really saying, okay, here's here's how we currently flow product. Here's what our current lanes look like and, and distribution points, so on and so forth. And it's really kind of taking a look at, because one of the trends that we're seeing in the industry is kind of supply chain design becoming a much more continuous business process as opposed to something that's done, you know, once every year, or once every five years, or when a big merger and acquisition occurs, but really something that the companies are really asking these what-if questions a lot more and doing it continuously. So it kind of strikes me that as part of taking this more integrated holistic perspective, that companies ought to or are uh, kind of looking at their uh, at their transportation networks um, as part of a supply chain design, you know, engagements and questions to see what the different options are, and then that helping to inform or in some cases drive the, the sourcing process. I mean, do, do you see that? Yeah, I think we do. Um, and the certainly to your point about going out for network design every three to five years, I think a lot of our customers go through that process. And um, and I think that's where, you know, you sort of have to ask your, your, yourself the question, are you really doing what's right for your business today or are you doing what you did last year? Um, and I think that's a critical question that, you know, every time we go out to market, whether it's sourcing um, logistics or anything else, we need to be asking ourselves. So I, I think that's a great point. And I, the other thing that I think is under, um, that we see with some of our more strategic companies is carrier development. So they're looking at um, not only reoptimizing the network and seeing how it shifts, but they're also being very, very purposeful in how they're maintaining their network and their carrier networks essentially to say these are my strategic carriers um, and they might work on my most important important areas but I need to also develop you know particularly in the US where there's you know there's so much um, competition I need to be working to develop other carriers essentially in my network and so um, I think that those two play very very well together in terms of you know not only looking at the network design but also the strategy around your carrier base 
Yeah, no, great, great point. Uh, yeah, we're kind of coming up short on time here. I've got a couple of questions left, but I just want to remind those of you that are watching live that if you do have a, a question for Christy, that now would be the time to, uh, you know, put it in in, in the uh, submit a question uh, box. Uh, so, so going back to kind of the, the technology piece as a way to kind of uh, get people thinking around what capabilities or attributes they should look for in a solution. I mean, what, what are some of the, again, high level capabilities, attributes that they should look for in a, in a logistics sourcing solution? Uh, I would say the first one, and it's probably the most overlooked, is uh, for the carriers. I can still there see you, Chrissy. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> my, computer, my computer decided to go to sleep. Um, <laughs> the uh, Really, for the carriers, um, how easy is it for the carriers to bid? I think that's probably the most important because I think we get caught up, and certainly as a sourcing professional in my career, I've gotten caught up in how easy is it for me to do, and I forget sometimes that you know there are all these companies out there that are going to be bidding, and sometimes in some cases hundreds of companies. And if it's not easy for them to be able to bid and you know, sort of user friendly for them, then the data that you're getting and the bids that you're collecting, you know, may not be very good. And so. For me, I think the most important all thing always is how useful, you know, and easy to use is the tool for your carrier base. Particularly, you know, we know that carriers go from very, very professional, you know, very large professional co companies to sort of the small mom and pop shops. And it's important for everybody to be able to um, sort of be able to use the, the tools that you're using. And so um, one of the things that examples, I guess, I like to highlight about this is that for you and your picking tools, it's important to pick a tool that if you're going to market on five or 10,000 lanes, let's say, and you're sending bids out to all of those carriers, that if I'm a carrier, a small carrier that has 50 lanes, let's say, I don't have to trudge through 10,000 lanes to figure out which 50 lanes I'm gonna bid. So I think that's probably one of the most important um, pieces is does the solution really let you hone in from, from a carrier standpoint and just show the carriers what's relevant for them, um, whether they're a big company that would actually bid on all those lanes or a small company that would only bid on a few of those lanes. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest piece um, is you know, usability. Um, the other two, I think, are really around the mathematics and the optimization and analytics. So um, flexibility, I would say, flexibility to be able to essentially don't let your solution drive the way that you're going to market, you know, really, the solution needs to be flexible so that whether you're going to market for a particular mode, multimodal, whether you're looking at you know doing um, sort of very complex you know network optimization, that the solution is flexible to be able to um, to handle what you need it to do in a way that you don't have to go back through the custom development cycle every single time you need to make a change. And so that's important. I, the other two pieces I would say are the reporting and analytics as well as just the the optimization algorithms to be fair. Um, so from an analytical perspective, you know how much of the analytics are really there to provide you actionable information. So you know does the solution have built-in outlier analysis, uh, bid comparisons, um, are there bid statistics and rankings? So out of the box you you know you can tell who your top 10 um, carriers are for a particular lane and it's it's something that is automatically built in that's very, very quick. Um, again, going back to the cycle where if you don't have a solution that's not flexible and you're going back and having to ask the service provider to either set up custom reports or to do work for you, then that takes you know more time in your process and takes away from the time that you should really be spending on the strategy and making the decisions and thinking about how is this really going to work for my business versus you know doing mathematical computation. So, I think that that's probably the the biggest piece um, from a you know a reporting and analytical perspective. And then I think the scenario analysis and the constraints. You know, when you're optimizing, um, really being able to hone in on you know even the smallest data points that you have in your data set and optimize on that. I gave the example of you know hazardous material earlier, and you know that's probably a very shining an easy example um, that shows. You know, I want to be able to, for these 10 lanes going to this customer, you know, I need to be able to have our, you know, our best carriers on. And so I don't want to look at any carrier that has less than a, let's say, 98%, you know, delivery performance or a, you know, 100% safety rating. So those are really 
important things to, to be able that the solutions need to be able to to get to. No, oh, those those are all great points, and and I particularly like that that first one in terms of making it easy to use, uh, you know, for the for the carrier base. I think we we talked about kind of the 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 evolution of these tools in terms of for the the shippers, right? In terms of these solutions becoming easier for you to use for them and easier to configure. But I think we can't forget that it, there's there's two sides, right? There's there's multiple participants to this whole process, and if it's if it's easy for you as the shipper, but it's onerous for the carrier community. Uh, the whole thing breaks down, right? And I, I think there is such uh, a diversity in terms of the capabilities out there in the carrier base, in the carrier community, uh, that you really have to, you know, if, if you if the solution really only caters to the very large ones and not the smaller ones, um, you know, you're not going to be as effective in, in um, uh, really executing efficiently, you know, a, a bidding process. Um, you know, Christy, uh, since we're out of time, I'm going to go right to my last question here. Uh, you know, as, kind of as a way to wrap up, I mean, what what actions should companies take today to start making better logistics sourcing decisions? Yeah, um, I would say first reevaluate, you know, from a strategy perspective, um, hone in on what your strategy is and then start to ask yourself, does the tool really help your strategy? So if you're, a, you know, a company that is low cost, you know, is it helping from a low cost perspective? If you're high touch or high service, you know, are you really getting the flexibility and the answers that you need from the solution, essentially, um, to be able to help, you know, you really drive the business strategy that you're looking for. So I think that, you know, from that perspective, mostly just reevaluating internally and taking a step back to say, instead of going in straight into the bid process to, you know, sort of take a step back and align, you know, am I aligned with the corporate strategy? Um, is this bid, you know, and are, am I asking the right questions to my carriers, you know, um, am I gathering the type of information that I need um, to really make that decision? Because, you know, as we talked earlier, a lot of a lot of the sourcing process is always been focused on very quantitative, you know, cost related um, type of metrics. And so I think in the world, particularly when it comes to logistics and, you know, we're looking at customer movements and very critical movements. It's important to also look at the qualitative pieces that are sometimes harder to quantify, but um, if you take the time to do it, I think that you'll, you know, there's a better outcome at the end for your overall business, um, not, you know, not just from a savings or dollars perspective, essentially. Great, great. Uh, the food for thought and, and, and advice there, Christy. Uh, you know, I'll end like I, I end every episode. You know, we always manage to just scratch the surface on, on these topics that we address here on, on Talking Logistics, but you know, certainly you provided some great, um, you know, uh, uh, thoughts and food for food for thought and, and advice for, for companies. And, and certainly uh, this is a, a topic that I'm sure we'll, we'll continue to address uh, and discuss with uh, uh, in the industry in the, in the weeks and months ahead, because it is such a, you know, important part of uh, of the overall end to end supply chain, you know, process that companies are, are looking to improve upon. Um, so, again, Christy, thank you very much for making time to be with us today. Thanks, Adrian. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you all who joined us uh, live today. We didn't get any questions, but if you are watching this episode on demand and you've got a question for uh, Christy, uh, you can find this episode on TalkingLogistics.com and you can post a question or a comment there. And I'm, I'm sure Christy will be more than happy to respond via that medium. So again, thank you all for joining us today and uh, look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.